I'm Ian Hall, I'm uh, farming east of Brooklyn at the locality of Alderside. We run 4,500 hectares out here. All the arable land is leased currently, but the uh, forestry estate we still own and manage. It's uh, pretty exciting times to be in forestry because of all the various changes that are happening. Uh, and in our particular situation, we're running 300 and, a bit over 350 hectares, comprising around about 167 hectares of, of uh, pines and two estates of sandalwood. There are two uh, 10 hectare sites of, of brushwood. A result of me having a, an interest in the wider field of forestry, which means I'm therefore uh, the inaugural chair of Avon Grey Wheat Belt Tree Cropping, currently the chairman of uh, Wheat Belt Australian Forest Growers and a board member of Wheat Belt NRM. The forestry estate uh, where we're standing right now is a, uh, a taxa trial belonging to the Forest Products Commission. It's a, uh, uh, a Brucia taxa trial and it's a robust estate which can grow uh, in a, uh, a dry wheat belt type climate that we have in the south central region of, of Western Australia. And it's probably in the longer term going to outperform the more commercial Panasta estate. The Sandalwood estate is a very successful and uh, looks like going to be a very profitable long term proposition and probably would be the most profitable, at this point, most profitable estate for people to consider. The reason for that is that it's a naturally occurring species, the sandalwood, has a number of hosts that it can, uh, can rely on to assist it in its growth, but it does need a host, a host plant. And as such, right across an extensive area of the wheat belt would, should be able to grow successfully. And the reason I can quite confidently say that is that the uh, stuff grows right out into the Mulga Desert country of only 8 inch rainfall or, or 200 millimetres. The forestry estates that we are now currently growing will probably be a much more integral part of the wider farming uh, environment that we see today. I got fairly excited about being able to plant something on our land, uh, the land that was of low commercial benefit it was very, very hard to get a yield benefit out of and, and quite frankly we were looking for another end use. We put in 167 hectare pine estate on the farm here. We did that in partnership with the Forest Products Commission and the reason that we did that was because we needed expertise to be able to do it. We, we would have been going blind uh, or blindly into this enterprise and we're also doing it at the time of the year when uh, we're doing our mainstream cropping. Uh, we couldn't do the both things at the same time and do them properly. Well, we've been very, very pleased with the performance of FPC, their, uh, their planting, their uh, follow-up, the managements of the site, and they're still doing it. In 2002, then, uh, they did a follow-up with 40 hectares of sandalwood. That same estate, or the same process went through where they, they, they put the crop in on a very, very dry year, an equally, equally bad year with uh, 1972. In other words, uh, six inches of rain or 150 millimetres for the 12 months over the, over the year. The um, so-called commercial uh, grain crops we had here were a huge loss. Uh, in fact, uh, two of the crops that we put in didn't even get the seed back. So when you're looking at the vagaries and variabilities of your normal commercial crops, having a, uh, a tree crop there as a, maybe a stabiliser into the future, it became even more attractive. The follow-up that FPC did to make sure that that estate jumped away to a good start after a, or a good future after a very, very tough start was second to none and it's turned out to be a very profitable enterprise uh, from year five onwards. It was terrific to see just how quickly you could get a return off a forestry estate, in this particular case with the seed crops. The opportunity came uh, out of the blue really uh, uh, from um, a uh, Avon Catchment Council funded project to uh, put in a demonstration site for, of brushwood and we were approached to do that. It has three provinces in it and the three sites there show a clear indication as to what's suitable on a sand over gravel site uh, in a 330 odd millimetre rainfall area but with seepage. There are lots and lots of different variances and we know all and understand that and these three uh, provinces do show up some real distinct features of where they should, where a crop should or shouldn't be grown. And when you're a farmer, you really do like to look after your environment. So basically you've got a triple bottom line uh, that, that, that you look at as a part of just 
you're part in society. Of course you've always got to spend a dollar. So you've got the profitability side and that's the most common bottom line that most people uh, look at and of course it's paramount that you do. Then you've got the social benefits. Social benefits of course uh, flowing through to, um, to future uh, uh, employment opportunities for, for, for local people or for people further af uh, afield. You've got the uh, environmental uh, issues which need to be confronted. As people would be aware, the vast majority of the, of the region that we live in uh, was cleared. And it was cleared uh, as, as, as a part of, of the legal requirements to freeholding land. Uh, you know, if you didn't clear it, you couldn't freehold it. And if there were a few trees standing up and had rabbits in it, you had to chop them down and get rid of the rabbits. Well, of course, since that point we saw what the land degradation problems that brought. Now, salinity is the most common one that people look at. Erosion, wind erosion and water erosion were the other, other two big ones. Well, a little bit of forestry goes a long, long way towards stabilising the environment in terms of uh, wind and water erosion. And it surprisingly doesn't make all that much difference whether it's done with alley farming or block plantings. We have seen the benefits after a very dry year of these block plantings, having the ability to just break the high speed northwest winds that come through in the early part of the winter before a, uh, before a front. And sure, you get some dust, but the, uh, the, 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 the land movement has been cut. But the days of seeing fences go under dirt are well and truly long gone. We had a lot of country and still have a little bit of country that is poor performing country for farming, mainstream farming. If you wanted to run livestock on it, it would blow away. It was, the soil surface was that fragile. It's just sand. If it were, wanted to crop it, the yields were always low. And therefore you put your $300 a hectare down into the ground and maybe get 200 back. It was uh, uh, nice to swank around to say put a lot of acres in, but then those acres aren't performing. It's just a, a slow way to, to uh, go broke. It was a silly thing to do. <clears throat> so we needed something that was going to stop us farming that country. Now some people would say that you could just go around it, and that's quite true, you could. In some country we did, because it was just drifting. But at the end of the day, you needed something that was positive going on in, on the estate that you owned, as well as actually physically stopping you even thinking about going and throwing a handful of money into the dirt to get just a little bit back. Now, the country where our estates are, where we're standing right here, as a matter of fact, was drifting sand. Uh, can, uh, most of where the pine country was was either fragile or low yielding country. It didn't matter whether it was livestock or whether it was um, uh, cereal cropping or, or legume cropping, it was just not going to return a profit consistently. It was only going to return a profit probably three or four years out of ten, which is enough to get most farmers excited to give it another go, but it just wasn't sustainable. By putting the uh, estate down, it just physically stopped us being able to go through there. And of course, since that point, it's had all the NRM benefits. And those NRM benefits, uh, well, we're standing in one of them right now. It's quite windy out there, and in here it's just beautiful. Across the Upham Valley region, uh, we have an area that's twice the size of Tasmania. And if we can get 10% of that planted, you've got real um, uh, opportunities then for being able to start new industries, maybe in the bioenergy uh, field or maybe in new fuel opportunities. You know, the things that really are being thought about now but haven't been actually uh, into the mainstream commercial life. The benefit of being able to do that is that, in, like in our own operation here, we're 8.5% of our total land area is in a uh, forestry estate and, you, and, and all it has done to the farm is increase the profit. If you could do it, superimpose that acro uh, across the entire Avon River Basin, uh, similar outcomes are likely to happen in the overall scheme. And that would then therefore lead on to further job opportunities, new industries, uh, some new products that probably haven't even yet been invented. The NRM benefits and the services that the NRM uh, people uh, have done in the past and hopefully we'll be able to continue to do into the future to assist landowners and land managers to, uh, to put the right plants in the right place to achieve maximum benefits for taking poor performing country out of mainstream farming and putting it into forestry and allowing the good quality country to go on with the mainstream farming is something that uh, we, put, we should all aspire to.